from San Jose, California, and brought to you by Think Tank Learning. Welcome to Meet the Experts. This is a forum in which we pick the brains of experts and professionals from various industries. We give students inspiration by showing them the academic journeys that they can imitate as they prepare to become experts themselves. Welcome to Meet the Experts. I'm your host, David H. Nguyen, and today we're going to talk about how mail is delivered inside a cell. We all know what happens when you throw a handful of salt into the swimming pool. The salt dissolves. But why is it that when you jump into the swimming pool, you don't dissolve? Well, the reason is because of something called membranes. Membranes are oily layers that can block the movement of water. But more than just being a layer of oil on top of water, the membranes in your cells can bend into different shapes, form little pouches to store things, hold molecules that serve as street signs and mailing addresses. So this is why membranes are involved in so many different types of diseases. Well, our special guest today is at the forefront of studying how membranes work inside the cell. He is Randy Schechtman. Randy Schechtman is professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of California at Berkeley. He is also an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. After several decades of research, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2013. Uh, though receiving uh, many lucrative offers from private universities throughout the years, Dr. Schechtman has declined these pay increases so that he could stay at Berkeley to support public education. I had the honor of learning from Dr. Schechtman, both as an undergraduate and a graduate student while I was at Berkeley. And that honor continues today as I interview him on this show. Professor Schechtman, welcome to Meet the Experts. Thank you, David. Pleasure to be with you this afternoon. To start off, could you describe uh, the work that you did uh, that led to the Nobel Prize? Sure. Well, you've given an uh, introduction yourself. What cells in our body uh, uh, have are membranes, not only surround the cell, but also that surround compartments inside the cell. And these compartments inside the cell are involved in capturing molecules like proteins that have to be exported outside of a cell. So things like insulin or the proteins in your blood or antibody molecules, they are all made inside of cells. Uh, they are water loving, so-called hydrophilic molecules, and yet they have to be exported outside of the cell by a process that's called secretion. And the way that happens is that there's a special machinery uh, to pick these things up, to package them into little carriers that deliver them to the cell surface where they are discharged to the cell exterior without breaking the cell membrane. This process was studied using very high-powered electron microscopes in the 1960s and 70s to discover the overall uh, flow of uh, information in the cell. But uh, it wasn't until the work that we started in Berkeley in 1976 and um, um, in another laboratory, James Rothman, at, then at Stanford University, uh, at around the same time, uh, we in my lab developed a genetic approach to studying how, the, how this process works which allowed us to identify the genes and thus the protein molecules that organize this pathway. And these, machine, th these protein molecules constitute little machines that move things around the cell. And we did this by studying a simple organism, baker's yeast. And it turns out, because of evolution, that this process, this complicated process, is evolutionarily conserved over a billion years of evolution. And uh, Rothman, in his lab at Stanford, discovered the human proteins. And we discovered uh, together that the genes that we, dis that we found in yeast are the same as the proteins that he found in human cells. And thus, the two, uh, the two organisms, humans and yeast, separated by a billion years, uh, uh, share the same machinery, conserved through a billion years. So uh, it was on the basis of that, uh, our initial discoveries and on the uh, similarity between what happens in, in yeast and in human cells that Rothman and I and another investigator shared the Nobel Prize. Wow, and so what medical breakthroughs were made possible um, by research about movement of things inside the cell? Well, first of all, we now know, because of all these genes that we discovered, that there are human diseases that affect some of these genes, uh, and they affect processes that are really in unpredictable ways. But um, I think perhaps the most important direct application of the work in my lab 
was uh, after we discovered that yeast cells have this export machinery that's fundamentally conserved, uh, the biotechnology industry, which was growing up in the Bay Area, decided to use yeast as a platform for the production of uh, useful quantities of, of, of human proteins. For example, uh, insulin, human recombinant insulin can be manufactured inside of a yeast cell. If you just uh, introduce the gene for human insulin into a yeast cell, you can fool the yeast cell into making human insulin and exporting human insulin outside of the yeast cell into the culture uh, vat uh, in a you know, huge um, uh, fermentation uh, growth of, of yeast cultures. So now it turns out one third of the world's supply of human recombinant insulin is made by uh, secretion, protein export in yeast. That's um, you know an example, one of many examples where uh, the investment in basic science, which has been made largely by the by the U.S. federal government, has paid off quite unexpectedly in dividends. And uh, so it continues to be very important that we support basic science in universities. Uh, where investigators are just given the opportunity to explore their own curiosity. And then the discoveries that result from that, uh, if they are of a fundamental nature, very often lead uh, quite unpredictably to the most amazing uh, applications and opportunities for uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, technology. Definitely. Wow. Okay. So the shipping of things inside a cell has been described um, as a postal system, similar to the United States Postal Service. Could you explain how this is possible? Yeah. Well, so a cell, a, uh, let's say a human cell, um, has 23,000 genes. And that means at least 23,000 different proteins, uh, all of which are made inside the cell. But only uh, maybe about 30% of them uh, are uh, exported outside of the cell. So in order to be exported, they have to be distinct. The, the proteins that are destined to be exported have to somehow be distinct from those majority of proteins that are designed to work and allow a, a cell to grow and divide. And one of the signals on a protein that's going to be exported is a kind of a zip code. Um, at the beginning of the protein, it's a little signal that says uh, to the protein, you have to be tucked away in a special membrane in order to be segregated <clears throat> and then to be exported from a cell. That's only one of several different signals or zip codes that a protein has that tell it exactly where to go and how to get there. And so uh, the Postal Service is, a, is an apt uh, um, uh, analogy to how, how a cell operates to distribute proteins to different destinations. So what would you say uh, would be the current challenges and future frontiers in studying uh, membrane biology and the trafficking of particles inside cells? Yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the steps in the pathway that's uh, very important is the very last step where a packet um, of uh, molecules, uh, which is itself a little membrane called a vesicle, uh, comes up to the cell perimeter and that little vesicle merges at the cell surface by a process called membrane fusion. And the, the, what's inside the particle, inside the vesicle, is dumped to the cell exterior. That, that pathway is what for example, insulin uses to be secreted in the pancreas. But it's also the pathway that is used for nerve cells to communicate with each other or for a nerve cell to stimulate a muscle cell. In that case, the little packets or vesicles carry chemical neurotransmitters uh, such as dopamine, which is deficient in patients with Parkinson's disease, or serotonin, which affects mood, or uh, acetylcholine, which is the major neurotransmitter in the brain that is... Uh, diminished and eventually it's uh, greatly reduced when patients succumb to Alzheimer's disease. So now that we know uh, how these little packets are poised at the cell perimeter and how they are discharged by the process called membrane fusion, there is an opportunity to intervene, possibly therapeutically, to control that event. And that is a, a, a forefront uh, opportunity to control uh, neurodegenerative diseases and uh, psychiatric diseases, all of which I believe will be intimately linked to the normal and uh, abnormal 
movement of neurotransmitters by this uh, pathway of, of export. So I think this uh, pathway will be fundamental in understanding, eventually developing drugs that, to treat uh, um, uh, psychological, neuropsychiatric, and neurodegenerative diseases. Fascinating. Okay, so then how uh, how does studying membranes uh, in cells uh, help us understand uh, things like viruses and uh, other infectious agents? Well, many viruses, uh, of course, uh, the, all viruses have to get into a cell, which means that they have to interact with the membrane. And they do so in different ways. Some, uh, some viruses, uh, like um, uh, tumor viruses, have a little membrane envelope themselves. And that membrane envelope carries... Uh, an infectious RNA molecule, that is the, the viral genome, and that genome has to be introduced into the cell, and the way that happens is by the membrane that surrounds the virus merging at the cell surface or being swallowed up by the cell and entering into one of the membranes that, that is part of this export machinery. So there's an intimate connection between a virus like that and, uh, and any virus and membranes that surround the cell. So they have to deal with membranes. And they use some of the machinery that the cells use for their own purposes to invade the cell. And the, and the cells have evolved um, mechanisms to try to uh, destroy viruses by creating membranes that swallow up the virus particle and uh, dump it into a kind of the cellular stomach uh, called the lysosome. So there's a pathway called autophagy that this year's Nobel Prize in Physiology Medicine was given to the man who also use yeast to discover the genes that are required for this process called autophagy, which is the normal uh, process that a cell uses to dispose of its own garbage. Um, and, but this process in mammalian cells, in human cells, is, uh, is employed by the cell to try to rid the cell of infecting ba in, in infectious bacteria and viruses that enter the cell, and before they have a chance of taking over the cell, they can sometimes be surrounded by a membrane uh, and then delivered to the lysosome for destruction. So there's a constant battle between the virus or the bacteria and the cell, all of which involves interactions between membranes. Wow. Okay. Well, we're used to hearing about uh, how DNA uh, is the code in living organisms, um, but what about membranes? Are there code-like patterns uh, in membranes? Uh, and uh, might that code be uh, in some ways more complex than DNA? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, that's a very good question. Um, membranes have uh, protein molecules. Uh, uh, cells are distinguished by their different protein composition in the in the membrane. But membranes also have um, molecules that are greasy. They're lipids, uh, specifically phospholipids, and uh, these lipids uh, also have a kind of a built-in code. There's a particular lipid that uh, receives one, two, or sometimes three or four phosphate groups. And each of these different modified forms of this lipid provide different information to that lipid <clears throat> uh, on the cell membrane. So there is a complex code uh, of proteins, lipids, and uh, sugars. There are sugar molecules <clears throat> that are attached either to proteins or to lipids. And the arrangement of these sugar molecules in branch structures is uh, even more complex than the information that's found in DNA because it's not just a linear sequence, it's a branched three-dimensional structure which presents a great deal more complexity and provides cells with their unique identity. Wow, okay. For those of you who are just joining us now, we are interviewing uh, Professor Randy Schechtman, Professor of Molecular Cell Biology at the University of California, Berkeley, and also recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2013. Dr. Sheckman, could you describe uh, your educational journey starting from high school? Sure. Well, I grew up in Southern California. Um, I went to a public high school. I, my classmates uh, were all from, you know, more or less middle class, working class families. I never knew anyone who went to a, a private institution when I was growing up in Orange County. Uh, I was always very interested in science. Um, I had... Um, I earned enough to buy a student professional microscope when I, uh, when I was a kid, and that became sort of my pride and joy throughout high school. Um, money was always an issue, so uh, my parents wanted me to go to, to a local state college, but I 
I had my eyes set on a university in uh, UCLA, was about 30 miles down the, down the freeway. And um, that was back in 1966 when admission to the University of California was more or less automatic if you had the grades. You didn't even have to take um, the SAT test. And my grades were good enough, so I was given automatic admission to UCLA. And it was thrilling for me because it, was, it opened up my eyes to a new world of science. I had started with an ambition to go to medical school, but in my freshman year at UCLA, I was given an opportunity to work in a research laboratory. And um, that uh, influenced me tremendously. And as a result, I decided to, uh, that, that science was, scientific research was going to be my career. I did, I did well. I, um, I published uh, four papers when I was a university student and uh, was admitted to a very selective program in biochemistry at Stanford. It was uh, the, 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 certainly the best biochemistry department in the world. And uh, I had the um, great uh, privilege of working with uh, one of the greatest biochemists of the middle part of the 20th century, Arthur Kornberg, who had won a Nobel Prize in 1959 for discovering the enzyme that copies DNA. Um, and uh, that was uh, part of a revolution in, in molecular cloning that started there in that department. Um, I took that knowledge um, and uh, decided that I wanted to work on biological membranes to do something a little different that wasn't quite as competitive as the work that I found uh, myself doing in graduate school. And uh, then I decided to do a postdoctoral uh, fellowship period of two years at UC San Diego. So I continued to stay in California, but moved back down to Southern California. And I was a postdoc at UCSD from 1974 to 1976 where I uh, learned about how membranes could be studied and I developed a, an idea about how to study membrane assembly yeah, and specifically in yeast, as I told you earlier. And then when I came to Berkeley in 1976, I started on a brand new adventure, which was to try to find the molecules that are involved in this export process. And um, being at Berkeley, I had the great advantage of, of brilliant students. Uh, I had some, uh, wonderful students throughout my career and right away in my first year I had an absolutely stunning graduate student who uh, was was keen to use genetics uh, to dissect this process of export and uh, he and I then embarked on a search for mutations that block protein export and uh, that worked out uh, extremely well and we were able to uh, identify a couple of dozen genes and then we were off and running and uh, trying to figure out how these genes work. Wow. Okay. Well, at this point in our um, show, we reached a fun segment that uh, we call the trash talk time, triple T. Uh -huh. And so if uh, there's any fun, uh, playful trash talking that you want to do towards a colleague or a competitor in the field, uh, feel free to say it now and we'd be happy to invite them on to uh, respond to you. Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't like to make enemies. Uh, I, uh, I have, I might, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you a, a little story about my best friend. My best friend is, uh, his name is uh, Bill Wickner, William Wickner. He's uh, a faculty member at Dartmouth University. He and I were in Kornberg's lab together, and uh, he um, had come from Harvard Medical School where he'd worked on biological membranes. And uh, uh, the two of us at first were in a kind of a competitive situation in the lab because we were racing to do some of the same experiments. But we very quickly became uh, good friends, uh, so much so that he uh, introduced me to the woman who would become my wife, whom he used to date when he was a medical student at Harvard and she was a nursing student at Mass General Hospital. So um, I don't know that there's uh, any trash talk to be shared with you about Bill, but uh, he, he's uh, been a great, uh, a, a great colleague, a, a best friend, and, um, and I love him dearly. Probably okay. you, wanted, you wanted some more dirt about somebody, so I... <laughs> <laughs> well, we leave that uh, up to you, so... <laughs> All right, so uh, what advice uh, do you have for current high school students who want a career in molecular and cell biology? Well, you know, there are many careers in, in that, that touch on molecular and cell biology. So uh, if you're a high school student and you're interested in science, uh, I think the best, the best way to... Uh, to express that interest and to test your uh, enthusiasm is to do independent study projects. 
science fair projects. This was my, um, my major um, interest throughout high school. Every year I would mount a science fair project, and that's really how I, how I got into uh, uh, develop my interest in, in research. Uh, I think, you know, most of the time the courses that you take, even the advanced AP courses, um, are not necessarily challenging. They don't necessarily expose you to the forefronts and to, to the logic that applies when you have to think of, you know, an experiment that tests the frontiers of knowledge. And so you, you don't necessarily get that when you're doing a science fair project in high school, but it gives you a taste for what that's about if you do it, uh, if you take it seriously. And then I advise uh, high school students uh, to, you know, go to a good university, but, but don't, don't necessarily go to a university that is, is, is rated highly by the U.S. News and World Report. I think this is a, a false measurement of, uh, of exclusivity and often um, is a reflection of the wealth of a private institution and the number of alumni that give back to it. I think our public institutions are as strong as any, and I, I have no regrets about having uh, been at a public institution virtually my entire life. It's given me every advantage uh, that, I could have, that I could have asked for. But uh, you have to be, you have to go for it. You know, you have to grab uh, the initiative and you have to pursue things uh, of your, you know, of, with your own energy. Um, in a big public institution, things are not given to you. It's kind of like the real world. Uh, and so uh, if you can get into a place like Berkeley or UCLA or UC San Diego or, or virtually any of the public institutions in California. Uh, I would recommend if you're interested in science to as soon as possible seek out and try to work in some professor's laboratory and not worry about whether you have the right background. Um, it, worked, it worked well for me and I think um, anybody who really has a passion for science um, will find that passion um, better satisfied by working with a professor directly rather than just taking classes, because classes end up being a lot of memorization for the most part, unfortunately. But working in a lab really gives you a flavor for what, what science is really about. So your career was uh, an academic uh, research route, right, that route. Um, but what are other routes that, uh, for people who work in the, want to work in the life science who also study? You know? Sure. Well, there, there are lots of, uh, and I, think I was going to actually point that out. The, the, the great thing about, uh, about science is uh, there are many opportunities in, uh, in industry, uh, in the life sciences, biotechnology, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, in publishing, in public policy, uh, in law. There are many venues, there are many opportunities where uh, an understanding of how science is done can uh, investment finance can uh, can be very useful. Um, I would say most of the people who work in my lab now, uh, typically they want to remain in the Bay Area because it's an appealing place to live, and they will uh, most often now work in a biotechnology company. And these can be very exciting opportunities, especially in a beginning biotech company. It's a little risky, but. Uh, at a at a begin at a startup, you can have a, even as a newly minted PhD, you can have a significant role in the decision about what to pursue in the company. In my experience, the people who have from my lab who've gone into biotech uh, are all employed. The, you know, the rate of unemployment is very low, so I think there's, you know, they move around a little bit more, uh, so the job security isn't at one hundred percent, but the prospects for opportunities are very strong. So. Uh, I think there are lots of opportunities, and I think uh, you have to just find that for yourself when you get into, uh, as an undergraduate, I think a lot of kids work in labs. Um, some of them find that, that research is frustrating, and maybe not for them. If they're smart and willing to work hard, most of those kids will go off to medical school. Um, but there are many other opportunities, uh, even for those who wish to continue to do a PhD in molecular and cell biology. So we're aware that, uh, you know, a lot of our students, uh, it's easy for them to be inspired by someone like you who, you know, has the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, but then we also, uh, you know, want them to know that, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it's something that takes time and that's not always, uh, you know, the path is always smooth, right? And so 
Uh, we want to ask you the question, uh, were there times in your educational path when you felt inadequate or that you wanted to quit? Well, I, uh, I don't think I ever wanted to quit. Um, but I had, uh, when I was in college, um, in my last year, my sister died of leukemia. She was only 19 years old. And that was, uh, that was a tragedy for the entire family. And it really kind of shook me to my core. Um, I, at the time, I was really heavily invested in working in the lab. And uh, so much so that I stopped going to classes. And my grades started to fall. And I was put on academic probation. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I, I got out in time, <laughs> having already been admitted to Stanford for graduate school. So uh, uh, I got out by the skin of my teeth. But uh, that was a tough time for me. But I never, I never had any doubts about the path that I wanted to take. I, I was fortunate in that respect. I, I didn't. Uh, I felt that I had certain gifts that would allow me to continue even in the face of frustration and failure. And, and generally, in fact, as, as a, in a career in science, when you're working in a lab, as, as you probably experienced, there's a lot of frustration. You know, experiments don't work. You don't know why. It could be for good reasons. It could be for bad reasons. You don't know why. And if you're going to sustain yourself in a, in, a, um, in a graduate program or in a career in science, you have to be willing to look beyond the daily frustrations of things not working and keep your eye on the big picture. And if you're focused on the big picture, and if that big picture is exciting and continues to, you know, sustain your interest, then you can, you can overcome the, the problems that we all encounter on a daily basis. And so you have a passion for supporting public higher education. Why is that? Well, I, had the, I was the beneficiary. I'm a, I'm a poster child for the University of California. I, I started in 1976. Uh, just after the second term of uh, our current governor's father, his name was Pat Brown. Uh, 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 Brown Sr. had um, built up the UC system to its uh, current glory. Uh, it was uh, available for all the children of middle and working class kids, virtually free. When I started in 1966, uh, tuition was maybe, fees were maybe $40 a semester. I could uh, I lived in a student co-op, paid maybe $400 a term for room and board. I could work a summer job and pay for the whole school year. My, my father, we had five kids in my family. Uh, my father didn't have to pay virtually anything for our education. And that was all because public higher education, indeed all of public education, was considered an investment for, for the future. Uh, but as you know, uh, there's been an erosion in state support, and not just in California, and not just in Republican or Democratic states. It's, uh, it's uh, throughout the country, there has been a systematic erosion of support for, for, for higher education, much more so than for K through 12. K through 12 is somewhat protected in California, but higher education is not. And so we have seen an explosive, very unfortunate growth in the cost, in the tuition cost, that's the, the, the families and, and kids must sustain. And the, as you know, the, the greatest source of debt in this country is owed by, by students who accumulated um, bills for tuition at public and private institutions. It's uh, over $1.2 trillion of debt. So this is a tragedy, and I think the, um, the public institutions, the governments, have been remiss in uh, abandoning, virtually abandoning their, their role, their crucial role in sustaining public higher education. This is the future. The University of California is the engine of social mobility in this state. 70% of the kids who go to college go to public institutions, and yet they have to go into this serious debt. So I'm, I'm passionate about the role of public education, and I'm, I'm really kind of distraught about um, uh, the, the, the change that's happened at the highest levels. And um, I call on the friends of the university, alums, people who share my passion, to pony up and to reinvest both in uh, their elected officials and in private donations. And in fact, tonight, uh, in another hour or so, I'll be leaving to do a fundraising event for UCLA here in Northern California. So I'm, uh, 
I'm, I'm willing to do the, walk that extra mile to make sure that people are aware of the, of the importance of uh, this investment. Okay. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Schechtman, for your time. We're gonna open it up to some questions for our listeners. If you have any questions, please go ahead and post them in the comment section below, or you can email us at um, customercare at ttlearning.com. Uh, we do have a question. This question is from Chris. Um, he asks, what is Alzheimer's disease and how are cell membranes involved in the development of this disease? Sure, Chris, uh, it's a good question. Um, Alzheimer's is um, the result of the accumulation of a little piece of a protein that builds up into what's called amyloid or a plaque. So when patients, when people die of Alzheimer's disease, very often their brains are riddled with holes that are occupied by big aggregates of a little piece of a protein, a little peptide that uh, tends to aggregate into these large plaques. And um, the protein itself that gives rise to these little peptides uh, is a membrane protein. And it is a membrane protein that travels along this export pathway that I talked about earlier. And as it moves along in the cell, ultimately going out to the cell surface, it comes into contact with enzymes called proteases that nibble on the protein. And sometimes one of the enzymes that acts on it makes a nibble that generates a little peptide that tends to be more prone to aggregate than uh, when another enzyme happens to nibble on this so-called amyloid precursor protein. So it all has to do with the unfortunate interaction between this membrane protein, amyloid precursor protein, and, the, and an enzyme, the protease, that, that uh, makes a clip. And uh, if it makes the wrong clip, then it generates this little peptide that's prone to form amyloid, and that is uh, the basis of uh, Alzheimer's. Um, there are people who have a genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's, and sometimes the, the mutation that, that, ca that causes an early onset form of the disease is a mutation in the gene that encodes this amyloid precursor membrane protein. Sometimes the mutation is in the enzyme that makes the unfortunate clip in the amyloid precursor protein. And, and uh, those mutations cause the, the process to happen at an earlier age and cause the patient to die at a much earlier age as a result. Something like 15% of Alzheimer's patients suffer from uh, one of the, the well-known genetic forms of the disease. We have another question. This is from Zara. She asks, you mentioned um, you encourage students to actually do research. So how does one, as a high school student, actually go about working in a lab with a professor such as yourself? Yeah. Well, that's a little, that's, a more, that's more challenging when you're still in high school. I've had some high school students write to me uh, locally to work in my lab, but my lab is pretty crowded and it would be kind of difficult to do that. Um, uh, so, you know, you have to be persistent. I think it's, it's a little bit easier uh, when you're actually in a college, like you're, you know, enrolled at Berkeley or UCLA or Davis or something. It's a little easier once you're there uh, to approach a professor to ask for an opportunity to work in his or her lab. But in high school, it's, it's more challenging but um, if you are persistent and you um, send out uh, enough emails, you may find someone who's willing to sponsor you. It, it very often a strategy would be to look for the youngest faculty members, the ones who've just started their laboratory and might be eager to have some help and aren't yet crowded like my lab. Uh, and they, that may be a, a way to do it. Um, when I was in high school, I, I didn't really have access to a university. So I just, um, I had a friend who was a medical technician in the hospital and uh, she took me under wing and uh, taught me a little bit about bacteria and I just decided to set up my own home laboratory in my, in my bedroom. I built a little incubator with a rheostat and a light bulb and I had some Petri plates that I bought with my earnings and uh, I grew some bugs there and did, did my own work there. Um, I used to use, um, my mother's kitchen 
to keep my supplies. I, I learned from this medical technician that you could, a good source of nutrients to grow bacteria was uh, human blood. You used to be able to get outdated human blood from a hospital. And I say, I'd keep this outdated blood in my mother's refrigerator, much to her horror. And I would cook up Petri plates using her pressure cooker and, and then pour this blood into the Petri plate. And the bacteria would just love that. So uh, you, can, uh, you can do a lot on your own. You don't necessarily have to be uh, working in a university. But it, it helps to have more guidance than I did. Wow. Okay. Let me see. Okay. So this question is from Tim. Um, as a high school student who's actually interested in studying membranes, what major should I pursue in college? Should it just be general bio? Well, that's, um, that's a, um, a question that could be answered in many ways. Depends on your, um, uh, you know, sort of what level of, of uh, understanding you find satisfying. It may be a difficult question for you to answer for yourself right now, but if you, but you've had in high school chemistry classes, you've had physics class, you've had biology. Are you interested in organisms and cells or are you interested in molecules? Do you find the precision of chemistry and physics to be more satisfying than the more descriptive uh, aspects of, of a cell or a, or a whole organism? So that would determine you know, what you might want to choose to major in when you go to college. If you're more interested in in molecules and in, in chemical interactions, then it might be better for you to, to, to uh, think about majoring in, in chemistry. Um, uh, but if you're more interested in, in, um, in, in, in whole organisms and perhaps in cells, then a major in, um, in the biological science may, may be more appropriate. And uh, sometimes it's hard for you to know that until you actually get into college and you start taking classes. So, um, um, but you may have enough of your own sort of uh, self-knowledge to be able to decide whether you're more interested in, in the more precision of chemistry and, or the more description of biology. Okay. And this next question is from Jackie. Um, she says, hi, Dr. Shuckman. I'm a big fan of your work with yeast. Um, I've been reading that yeast can be used to produce clean energy. Um, is that true? And um, how much of that do you know? Yeah. Well, of course, there's a whole uh, world of uh, biotechnology and trying to, to produce biofuels. And um, there are uh, outstanding um, people who are in sort of fields of bioengineering that use uh, a systems approach to engineer the production of fuels by uh, changing pathways of metabolism in microorganisms, even in yeast. And uh, uh, they have met with some success. But the problem for now is that to be commercially viable, um, a biofuel uh, has an enormous um, difficulty, that would help, will have an enormous difficulty competing with uh, natural gas or petroleum, when, you, when all you have to do is dig a hole in the ground and extract natural gas or petroleum products, uh, a, a bioengineering approach simply can't be commercially competitive. So a lot of what's been done now to, in biofuels in microorganisms is to make specialty products, specialty organic compounds like perfumes or medicines where um, uh, where they would, will, would be competing with the chemical industry rather than with the, the, with the petroleum industry. Now that may change as we inevitably uh, deplete uh, the world's sources of, of uh, petroleum products, then maybe biotechnology will come to the rescue. But I'm hopeful by then that the alternative of, of solar and wind and um, um, more um, readily available uh, physical resources may uh, Maybe, maybe it's a solution. Okay, next question. This actually is from a parent of a high schooler. Her name is uh, Ratna. She asks, there's a two-part question. She asks, can high school students volunteer in research laboratories um, outside, of, um, outside of universities to get exposure to advancements and enhance their passions in 
um, cell biology, and also part two is how can how can the research on membranes help in treating terminal cancers or diabetes? Yeah. Well, the first one I've already touched on. Um, uh, one, you know, a student can approach a faculty member, you know, send an email. But the pro the problem is that uh, faculty members are um, often at a place like Berkeley or Stanford or wherever are often overwhelmed with requests from uh, undergraduates at the home institution who are right there and who have you know a little more preparation to work in a laboratory. So um, it's it would be difficult. I I've had many inquiries from high school kids who want to come to my lab, but I I already have seven. Berkeley undergraduates working in my lab, and it would be very difficult for me then to have the time and uh, uh, assign a, one of my current students to supervise the activities of a, of a, of a high school student. So um, what I would recommend instead would be for that high school student with parent to make an appointment to come and visit with a professor just to talk about uh, their, their interest in science. I've done that with, men, with some high school kids who've just come to chat with me, and I'm happy to do that. It's just more difficult to have someone in my laboratory supervise their activities. So uh, I don't mean to discourage, um, but that, it's, it, that, that there's a problem uh, just in, in time and manpower to do that. Um, the other question is, what, what about uh, membranes will help with cancer? Well. Um, Cancer is a, a multifaceted problem. Um, I'm aware of um, the most, most exciting developments in cancer now that have to do with uh, the development of immunotherapy. Um, that was actually initiated by a, a former colleague of mine who was an immunologist here at UC Berkeley by the name of Jim Allison, uh, who discovered uh, a way of unleashing the power of T cells through uh, 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 a protein that interacts with cells and, uh, and interacts with, with a membrane receptor that normally puts a break on the power of the T cell to attack a virus infected cell or a, or a cancer cell. And he found a way of removing that break and uh, unleashing the power of a T cell. So that involves a membrane receptor. All cell interactions involve membrane proteins. So, uh, to my mind, that's the most exciting development in many years in cancer treatment, and the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry is pursuing this at a breakneck pace. Um, just to give you a, a flavor for the power of this approach, through Allison's work, um, melanoma, which used to be a death sentence, virtually a death sentence, can now be largely controlled with something like an 80% remission cure rate for a disease that used to be fatal. This again, uh, as I said earlier, all comes from basic science. It comes from, in this case, an understanding of membrane receptors and how they are involved in uh, regulating a, the, the ability of a T cell to attack a, what, what the body would consider a foreign cell. So um, more basic research is, is, to me, the answer for uh, more advances in cancer therapy. Awesome. And one more question um, we have from someone named Vivek. Um, they ask, hi, Dr. Shuckman, are you using computers for your research? And if you do, uh, in what way are you using the computational power? Yeah, well, of course, I use a computer all the time. Here I am sitting in front of my computer, but it's, it's largely low tech, just uh, email. But we do. Um, uh, in recent years, we've, we've um, started to work on uh, evaluation of, of uh, uh, nucleic acid sequences where, where we generate millions and millions of reads of, of nucleic acid sequence. And, the, and that information has to be crunched by a computer to sift out information. So we do have some, I would say, at a relatively low level, use of computers to evaluate an enormous uh, data sets. Uh, for to, to, exa to examine uh, sequence similarities or differences in uh, uh, lots of uh, DNA and RNA sequence experiments. And I think that's probably very common in almost every laboratory to use computers to evaluate, especially to evaluate nucleic acid sequences. 
Now, Dr. Schreckman, this is um, a reference to our webinar from our last webinar. We actually talked about computational um, neuroscience. Do you see um, computer science merging with uh, biosciences as well? So for example, like your future graduate students that work under your lab, do you foresee them having to do some computational work? Sure, I, I think that more and more that a skill in mathematics and computation, computational biology will be crucial uh, to make discoveries on complex systems like the brain. Um, my own personal preference is to do simple things. I, I've always uh, succeeded in doing the simplest things possible that uh, don't involve uh, all that much uh, of a high-tech approach. But but um, but maybe that's me, and maybe my generation will now be surpassed by younger people who have greater skills in computation. And um, it is actually quite impressive when I hear seminars that crunch data on um, human genome sequences and use approaches from that uh, to, to uh, draw conclusions about basic cellular processes that would not have been possible by the relatively simpler techniques that I've uh, learned and used in my career. Awesome. Okay, that's all the time we have for today. Um, just to let all of our viewers know, we will be posting this webinar. Um, thank you for your time, Dr. Shekman. And uh, we'll see everybody next time on the next episode of Meet the Experts.